My name is Andy Goopmans. I run a number of services at AWS. I run an Amazon Elasticsearch service, uh, Amazon Neptune, which is our new graph database, and also Amazon Elastic Cache, which is, supports both Redis and Memcache uh, as a service. With me today is Kevin McGee. He's one of our senior engineers on the team. And we'll talk to you a bit about you know, how we think about you know, purpose-built databases at AWS, um, how Redis fits into the picture at AWS, and you know, how we think about it from a, from a database perspective. And then we're going to get into the hardcore of the session where I'm going to talk both about the infrastructure at AWS and how we think about you know, what needs to happen below the database there to really enable uh, innovation. Um, and then Kevin is going to dive a lot deeper into how we run Redis and also uh, hopefully leave you with a few tips and tricks uh, on what you can actually try after the session. So modern applications are becoming, uh, you know, a lot more demanding than in the past. There really isn't a one-size-fits-all. We see applications that are driving millions of requests per second. Um, data set size varies greatly. Some data sets are in the, you know, megabytes, gigabytes, or terabyte level. And we also see uh, petabyte uh, and even exabyte scale at AWS. And so as we think about these workloads, it's really a very, very diverse set of workloads. Uh, from a performance perspective, really depends on the application. We see analytic workloads that obviously can you know, run a bit longer. And we see the need for fast data, which is you know, either single digit millisecond or in many cases, you know, sub millisecond uh, latency. Redis, for example, you know, does about 350 microsecond uh, latencies in many cases. And then from a scale perspective in economics, it's all about a pay-as-you-go economy being able to scale up, being able to scale out, a lot of diverse use cases. Um, if you haven't read the blog from Werner Fogels, our CTO, about uh, our purpose-built database strategy, I highly recommend it. Really, the point he's making is one size doesn't fit, doesn't fit anyone, everyone. It really depends on the use case um, that you're developing. So for example, at AWS, um, we believe in you know, building the best tool for the job. So for example, um, if you need to analyze you know, terabytes or petabytes of data in search, right, you'll probably do that with Elasticsearch. We support up to three petabytes of data. That's too expensive if you're doing it in DRAM. Uh, graph database. Graph database needs locality. It really can't be sharded in a good way if you need high performance and you need ACID. We need a lot of ACID transactions by some of our customers. So we support up to 100 billion edges uh, in our graphs, so mega graphs and so on. And then, of course, Redis really serves our customers who need that sub-millisecond latencies. Um, for example, for caching, for, for uh, session stores, for messaging, and so on. So yes, while we do, you know, our goal is actually to offer a broad set of uh, capabilities. Uh, we don't really take the multi-model approach because what we see in these situations is the, the different applications our customers are building vary so greatly um, that it really depends on you know, what level of av availability they need, performance, do they need asset transactions, um, how much data. So for example, we announced time series at uh, reInvent. You know, when we think about time th series, we think about petabyte scale or more. Uh, because that's really the nature of connected cars and very big uh, time series database use cases. Typically, in most situations, we won't see those in memory because doing a petabyte in memory is going to be too expensive. So that kind of, you know, giving developers as much choice as they need and being able to build applications that are best for the business is really our, you know, primary approach. And where Redis fits in for us is in that terabyte scale. Okay, we think about it as more of a terabyte scale technology. We support up to 170 terabytes with Redis cluster on AWS. Um, and the use cases, as I said, are, you know, sub millisecond usually latencies. So things like ride hailing, uh, gaming, ad tech industry, just a lot of use cases. We probably still see about 70% of our use cases being caching but we're definitely seeing more and more uh, beyond caching use cases with things like session store and other uh, kinds of applications. 
Uh, we see the need to both, you know, scale up and scale out. Scale out is very nice because you can basically use smaller instances and scale out more. It gives you often more resiliency. Redis cluster also has fast failover and client-side routing. Um, so we're big believers in kind of, you know, Redis cluster. Um, obviously, the, you know, the downsides of sharding, if you do, you know, certain data sets, you want locality of the whole data set. So we basically believe in giving the option of both scaling up and scaling out based on what your application does. I'm not going to talk a lot about our service specifically, um, but really our key focus with Amazon Elastic Cash for Redis is to deliver an awesome choice for people. Really from our perspective, whether you use Amazon Elastic Cash, you self-manage on EC2, you use other partners on AWS, we just want our customers to be successful in AWS, and we make sure that there's a lot of option and a lot of choices basically on AWS, whether that's a partner option, it's something we do, or we just make sure Redis runs really well on EC2. And I'll talk a bit later about innovation we're doing at the EC2 level, and so you'll see there's a lot that we're doing that you can take advantage of, even if you're just running Redis on your, by yourself on, on your EC2 instances. So we, we really focus on you know, performance. Our, it, one of the key reasons customers are coming to Redis is performance. And so we do a lot of work to optimize not just Redis, but we think about the system as a whole, the networking, the, the, the OS, the hardware, and we have a very strong relationship with the EC2 team to really make sure we're building engineered systems that give you the best price performance um, you know, in the cloud. It's a fully managed service, so we take care of everything, like uh, you know, making it easy to back up the system, making sure that if hardware fails, we're replacing it, and we basically give a 20, you know, 24 seven um, support. Then we're the, we're the single throat to choke for anything Redis, whether it's happening at the Redis layer or a network cable you know, in a data center goes bad, and uh, we need to make sure we take care of failover and other things for our customers. And then last but not least, just making sure that we support you know, Redis at very large scale. So what are some of the big customers who are using Redis? Um, Expedia had an analytics pipeline. It wasn't being processed fast enough. There were about 200 million events a day that they needed to do pretty hardcore processing on. And they're basically using Redis as a cache, but as a cache as part of the analytics pipeline. So very, very interesting use case and working at you know, pretty big scale. Grab. Uh, which is uh, basically the Uber of Southeast Asia, um, is using Redis on AWS as a caching layer. And by using a fully managed service, they basically save between, they estimated between 30 and 40% of manpower, um, where they basically handed that over to us as a managed service provider to take care of their workload. How many of you are using a Peloton? I am, okay, I guess I'm the only one. If you like biking, Peloton is a really awesome bike. You can basically, you know, in your home, you can do uh, real-time uh, spinning classes. And it's all about also kind of, you know, competing with yourself, but you also see a leaderboard of sometimes thousands of people who are biking with you. And that is actually running on Redis and using sorted sets as a leaderboard. And G is using Redis as a session store with hash maps, um, which is a very, very typical use case, you know, for Redis. So you can see that Redis usage really spans pretty much every industry. It's really not an industry-specific solution. And um, you know, we're engaged with a you know, very significant amount of customers who are basically building applications using both Redis and using other purpose-built databases with Redis. So as I said, you know, primary motivation right, to go to Redis, I think are really two things. One is performance. The second thing is I just think it's an awesome API. Like you don't really have any other data stores. And when I, you know, when I try and describe kind of this notion of a data structure server to folks, they don't always understand what that means. But really the in-memory nature of Redis is not just about performance, it's about the fact that we have access to all these data structures which really are not well represented on something like a B plus tree in a, tr a traditional database, but are well represented in, a, in, in memory and that just creates an API that is really fun to use. But let's dig a bit deeper into performance and how we think about performance at AWS. Because you know, one of the things that we need to do at AWS is really deliver the best infrastructure for our customers, whether they're using a managed service or they're self-managing. 
and, and, and make sure that the cloud is truly delivering better agility, better performance, and better price performance. So there are a lot of things that impact performance. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit later on. Earlier, it was mentioned that like networking is a typical bottleneck. Well, I'll, I'll maybe change your mind at the end of this. The networking is probably no longer a bottleneck for many applications. So we do a lot of innovation on our networking. We do a lot of innovation on the server hardware. We focus also on server OS. And then Kevin will later on talk to you also about Redis itself. And then how we think about the full system and how that system really works in, in the most optimal way. So how did things used to work? You basically went and bought an expensive monolithic router, uh, switch that was, had a lot of functionality, super feature rich. But the problem with that was a, you know, very few vendors actually built those. They were very expensive because they were just so feature rich and had so many components uh, in them. And then, you know, when service providers like us used them, right, it was, it was very hard for us to actually debug them because they were kind of proprietary boxes and they were very complicated. And so it created an issue of basically cost and agility that ultimate, ultimately impacted you as users. And network was a pretty scarce commodity, right? So while everyone could get to it, we really couldn't push the boundaries on network in a very easy way, in a cost-effective way, where you could then innovate in a cost-effective way on your applications. And then th things started to change. What basically happened was we saw a large set of you know, providers starting to build components um, of, these, uh, of, the, of the networking pieces. So we saw ASICs, so basically application-specific integrated circuits that are focused on networking. Lo you know, lots of vendors started to build those. We started to see optical cables, optical connectors becoming more of a commodity. And then, of course, you know, both with open source and outside of open source, right, software became more and more open uh, and accessible. And so what we did at AWS is we actually partnered uh, with a bunch of companies and started to really own the networking and build networking on our own, working with partners. Um, and, and the key thing we were trying to do there is one, you know, bring the cost down. That's number one. Number two is, you know, increase security and basically built the system in a way that was more of a commodity and a scale-out commodity so that we wouldn't have single points of, uh, we, we wouldn't really get single points of failure and we would basically be able to deploy enough of these so you had very dependable latencies no matter where you were going. And the dependable latency is critical. If you look at kind of, you know, you look at your workloads in AWS, there's a huge focus on just making sure that, we're, that you don't have negative uh, impact from the networking. And so basically our networking is structured in this kind of closed network where we have you know, lots of switches that are all interconnected in different areas of our network. And basically it gives, it gives your EC2 instances an ability to reach other EC2 instances in a predetermined fashion. Uh, but if one, if one switch here goes out, nothing really happens. We just, we just, uh, it will just connect it, you know, through a different part of the network. And then your EC2, basically your EC2 instances are connected to this network. And what we decided to do is basically take a lot of the smarts outside of, out, out of the network, really simplify the switches. So our switches are like way, way simpler than these expensive switches we talked about. They're really software defined network switches um, that are focused on supporting, you know, our VPC, our virtual private, um, private environments. And then we moved some of that smarts also into the instance, into the actual EC2 instance, where the EC2 instances are aware of what VPC is, they're aware of security, and they're much more aware of the network. So you can think about this as, you know, on one hand simpler, but also more cost effective and very, very performant because we've basically taken out a lot of the a lot of the, you know, stuff that was sitting there in the network that no one was actually using. But one problem in actually taking out some of the smarts from the network and bring it into the EC2, into the EC2 instances is the fact that, you know, e your EC2 instances now are doing more work. They're doing more work around networking, around VPC, around storage access, which basically steals away from your CPUs. Right? And so you're basically not getting 100% of what you're paying for. 
Well, that's when we basically uh, continued to innovate and we built something called the Nitro system, which think about the Nitro system, we basically took networking, the majority of networking, majority of storage, management, security, and monitoring, and we took them into coprocessor cards on the instance, um, including a lot of the hypervisor functions. We only have a very thin hypervisor now in the customer instances, and most of that is actually now offloaded onto coprocessors that are sitting within your instances. So what that really means is today when you get uh, instances from EC2, you know, you can get uh, pretty close to bare metal performance, especially on things like the i316 extra larges and the R524 extra larges, uh, because networking and storage and, and management and security are basically sitting off instance. Um, and so what that does is it also not only gives you better price and better price performance, it also improves security and improves isolation. It also allows us to innovate much, much faster on your behalf and actually improve things like networking and so on. And so I'll show you some, I'll show you some of the progress we've made, but we're basically, to a certain degree today, treating hardware as software and iterating very, very quickly in making improvements that you then benefit from. So let's look at an example. Um, the C4 instance, which is actually not, not a very old instance, uh, basically supported a network throughput of 10 gigabit per second. The C5 instance, which is also quite new, supports 25 gigabits per second. 25 gigabits per second is actually pretty fast. Um, a lot of applications we have, you know, have a hard time actually pushing 25 gigabits per second. Um, but we just announced, um, you know, late last year, the C5N, which pushes networking to 100 gigabits per second. That is really, really fast. I mean, I would actually say the majority of your applications that are not tuned to take advantage of this will not take advantage of it. And so you're starting to see that actually the boundaries are changing. We're actually becoming, in many cases, more CPU bound, and we actually can push the I.O. Uh, so that, uh, that, of course, leaves a lot of room for innovation, you know, for us, right? Especially with things like Redis, where we can actually take advantage of that now and think differently about the problem. You know, packets per second as part of that has gone up more than three times, which means, you know, again, if you look at like a relational database, probably doesn't make a big difference because you're only going to get that many, that many requests per second. But in Redis, you can get hundreds of thousands of requests per second now. This starts to really matter. And so again, we see like a huge improvement that is possible uh, with Redis and in-memory data stores. If we look at the at SSD drives, uh, for those of you who remember the I2 uh, systems, which are really good kind of SSD-based systems, you know, they were doing 365,000 IOPS per second, which was actually, uh, you know, considered to be pretty good. That's not a bad number. But today, if you go and get an I3 instance from AWS, you can get up to 3.3 million um, IOPS per second. That is super, super fast. And just to give you a sense of you know, what that really means, it means that we can actually, um, we can get sequential throughput of 16 gigabytes per second. Now let me just do the math for you. We talked about 100 gigabits per second networking, 16 gigabytes to your disk. So you know, roughly 100 gigabits is about 12 gigabytes per second, plus minus, right? You're basically talking about your network now is pretty much as fast, almost as fast, as your ability to basically read from disk. So it starts to really you know, change how we can think about innovating and building systems that are you know, much more exciting. And if we also look at just uh, you know, more granular performance um, and we look at latency, so between you know, I2s and I3s and now we just introduced R5Ds, which are R5s, which are nitro-based systems, which basically include those nitro coprocessors that I talked about, and really fast NVMe SSD drives. Uh, we've basically taken down average latencies from about 70 microseconds to uh, 20 microseconds, and P99 latencies from 12 microseconds to 3 microseconds, uh, to 30, sorry, for 120 microseconds to 30 microseconds. So we're basically getting more bandwidth, our ability to access disk, and this is before Right, we see newer, newer kind of solid-state technologies coming out. 
that are going to, you know, even further reduce the latencies and give us a lot of opportunity to innovate. So what we're doing as a team is we're basically looking at a lot of the kind of cool hardware that's coming down the line and really making sure that we're tuning the environments that we deliver on ElastiCache and make sure that you're getting the best bang for the buck, right? And that's really kind of our philosophy at Amazon. Our goal is to continuously make things more cost-effective for our customers. You know, some companies, if, they, if the, as the product gets better, they start to charge more. In general, at Amazon, right, we try to make our product better and we try to make it more cost-effective at the same time. That's really kind of our philosophy and how we try and make sure that we innovate on your behalf. So some of the work, just to kind of give you an example of what that looked like, in the orange you can see our, our four instances, which are actually pretty good instances. The thing you shouldn't take away from here is our fours weren't good. Our fours are actually pretty awesome. Um, they're doing, you know, they're, they had good network bandwidth, good processors, a lot of memory. But then when we supported our fives, because our fives uses the Nitro system and Redis especially is very sensitive, you know, to, you know, kind of hypervisor performance and, and packets per second and so on and so forth, we, we saw a very significant boost in performance um, with our fives. So basically getting to about 200,000 requests per second from before, you know, in the 125, 130 or so. Then we started to tune those instances. We spent a lot of time, you know, just working with our hardware team to make sure we really configure the whole environment, the whole stack in the best possible way. And that's not always easy because every like mini instance type behaves a bit differently. So the R5 2 extra large is a bit different from the R5 4 extra large because we have more CPUs, we have, you know, the network bandwidth is a bit different. So we really made sure we kind of tuned every system and got to get the best performance. And uh, what you can see is we basically got to about 250,000 requests per second. Now, Kevin will talk about some other things we've done that push this performance even further. But you can see that just from the innovation we're doing at the hardware level and then really making sure we optimally configure the environment, we're really starting to drive much, much better price performance. And probably one of the, you know, cool examples for this and I know, you know, I don't know how many of you have kids who play Fortnite, but I do. And, and I try and, you know, make them not play too much of it. But Fortnite is a great example. It's from, a, you know, Epic Games is basically a company behind that. They have over 200 million players, um, high concurrency. So over 8 million concurrent users at times. And, um, you know, they came to us and said, you know, we have a big surge event and we want to provision a lot more, you know, Redis. And, um, you know, it's very easy as a provider to say, sure, why don't you go and provision more and, you know, we'll make more money. Um, but we're a very customer obsessed company. So we said, well, you know, we just got these R5s that just came out and we just tuned them and so on. And what we actually did was before the event, you know, we moved them to the R5 instances and um, they basically got way, way better performance out of them, lower latencies, higher throughput, saved them a significant amount of money and uh, just a great example of how the work we're doing is not just you know numbers on a slide but we really are helping our customers to drive down cost and basically spend less so they can spend more of their money innovating on new applications and on developers the other thing we you know do quite a lot of i mean this, there's one thing about optimizing a system it's another thing of really spending time with customers and understanding you know, what they're doing. And so I don't know how many of you know the RDB tools uh, kind of tool. It's an open source tool. The author of this tool is actually here at the conference. So you should uh, go and say hi. But it's a really cool tool that can re read your Redis snapshots and basically kind of give you offline some statistics about that. So we've basically, uh, you know, with some customers who ask us for advice, we kind of, you know, send them the tool they run the tool on their snapshots, and it gives us basically in an anon anonymous way just kind of the breakdown of the data structures, the key value sizes, and that gives us an opportunity to actually help guide them either to increase performance or save cost. Uh, we've also made some improvements in this, in this uh, open source project, which we're contributing back, which basically gives you kind of a nicer breakdown of how to, how to think of it. And um, just to give you some example of the kind of things we're seeing, 
this is not all representative because it's really the customers we're working with. Um, you know, we kind of look at the data type distribution. So we still see the majority of our customers are probably doing caching with, with simple string objects. Uh, hash is number two. I bet you that's probably a large of the portion of those are session stores. And then we see other data types also being adopted. This kind of helps us as we engage customers to, you know, look at their key sizes, look at their value sizes, look at the data structure, and then kind of help and, you know, talk to them. Of course, we also have a survey, so we kind of talk to them about the throughput requirements, latencies, what operations are they using, and we can kind of then provide advice uh, and kind of help right size those environments. In most of those cases, when we work with customers, um, you know, they're getting better price performance, they're saving money, and they're getting performance that is better. The other things we're seeing, you know, as part of those services, is a lot of use of TTL, which kind of tells us there's a lot of caching use cases out there. And then, you know, customers are actually using a lot of those long tail features, which is kind of really cool to see. And so, we, you know, we kind of continue to iterate on that with them. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Kevin here, who is going to take you deeper into Redis and how we run Redis at AWS. But again, I think the key thing to take away from this is uh, we don't think of Redis as just, you know, Redis the process. We think about the whole supply chain of the hardware infrastructure and the end-to-end -end -end performance and experience that you need, um, both in good times, how do we make it fastest, and also in not so good times if we have, you know, servers going out, network partition, and so on and so forth. We really built these systems to be, you know, super secure, available, and uh, resilient. So I'll hand it over to uh, Kevin. Cool. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. So as Andy was talking about, we've already taken care of uh, the performance of networking, server hardware, and server OS, and removed a lot of the traditional bottlenecks that would, you, you would encounter in an application usage even before you hit Redis. Uh, and so we started taking a look uh, at Redis to see how we could make it more performant to drive up the, those throughput numbers even further. Uh, Redis is single-threaded, uh, which makes it a lot simpler and easy to maintain and easy to understand. Uh, but it's, uh, it, and so it embraces the concept of sharding in order to scale out data. Uh, but we decided to take a look to see what within the Redis process we could uh, make uh, improve in order to drive up each single shard throughput. So the command execution uh, latencies within Redis are often uh, on the order of microseconds, so very small. Uh, we profiled Redis uh, under a high client load and found that actually about 75% of the time uh, spent within the single-threaded process was doing network I.O., so just being able to respond to clients, reading input, uh, re uh, replying with the responses to those commands, uh, and very little was spent actually interacting with the data structures in order to execute those Redis commands. Uh, so we decided to uh, take a look at this uh, problem to see if there is a, a way that we could solve it. Um, what it looks like under high contention here, just to show the example, is that individual clients will end out uh, connecting. And since all of the I.O. is serialized on the same thread, it shares time with the actual command processing. Uh, and so it lowers the amount of time that's useful for actual command processing within Redis uh, and then lowers throughput as well as increases latency since those clients are going to be waiting in line to be executed behind other I.O. operations. So imagine that we have uh, communication on a separate thread. So all of the socket I.O. can happen outside of the, the core Redis processing and can communicate with the, the main Redis thread uh, over uh, an in-memory connection. Uh, so with only one connection, you might not realize significant benefits, but uh, in many cases where there's high concurrency, you have multiple clients connecting simultaneously to Redis. And when we have more clients uh, connected, it offloads that sequential I.O. we saw before on the main thread uh, giving us significant gains in overall throughput. Uh, and as before, uh, because we are allowing the main thread to be more fully utilized, 
uh, clients don't have to wait in, in line as long to uh, receive their input or to process their output. Uh, and so the latency uh, measured under high concurrent situations is also significantly reduced. So uh, after prototyping this, we, we built this approach uh, in, uh, in Amazon Elasticache and announced support for our enhanced I.O. Uh, feature a few weeks ago. And in this case, we use spare CPU cores on very large uh, multi-core machines to offload the I.O., as, as I discussed uh, just previously. Uh, and so this graph uh, is an uh, add-on from the graph that we saw earlier. Uh, where there's an extra fourth orange uh, uh, bar here that shows the R5 throughput uh, after in our enhanced I.O. feature. And so with 100 clients, uh, which this workload measured, we saw up to 56% improvement on top of the additional the R5 tuning that we announced even uh, previous to that. Uh, and so we're able to achieve upwards of 400,000 requests per second in a, a mixed workload environment. Uh, with 800 clients, we saw an even uh, higher increase, up to 83% improvement in throughput. And overall so, saw up to 47% uh, drop in latency uh, for, for average P50 uh, client requests from, measured from the client side. Uh, so all of this allowed us to, uh, to improve the, the overall experience uh, significantly. And we have a blog post in the AWS database blog that goes into the specifics of the benchmark and how we measured this, uh, this performance. So now with both uh, faster hardware and some software improvements, Redis is overall much faster, but it still matters how you actually uh, y uh, connect to it and use it in your application in order to achieve uh, the best performance possible. And this generally comes down to two things, being client configuration and application architecture. So I'll, I'm going to talk through some of uh, some tips that you can use in order to, to realize some of the, the performance we just talked about. Uh, so many customers within Elasticash and outside run highly available configurations where they'll have a single primary and multiple replicas. And these replicas are available for, uh, for, for things like automatic failover in the case of a node uh, dying and being able to uh, still achieve high availability. But you can also use those nodes uh, in your application as well. Uh, and so, so many customers have them just sitting idle, but by reading from your replicas, you're able to achieve higher aggregate throughput on your shard because you uh, have multiple nodes that are serve, serving requests. Uh, and so this code snippet is from a Lettuce cluster client that demonstrates how to actually uh, read from replicas in, in your configuration. So the line six uh, read from parameter here allows you to read from your replicas uh, with replica preferred, but if there's no replica that's available or that exists for a given shard, then it'll fall back to reading from the primary. Uh, so in this way, you can uh, direct your requests, your read requests uh, across uh, the entire shard uh, and get it even uh, multiplicative uh, throughput uh, from a single node connection. Uh, the one thing that to note is that uh, the consistency model is different when reading from a replica. So here we're doing a set uh, of a value on line eight uh, and then a read from the replica on line nine. And in this particular case, the read uh, is not guaranteed to be consistent. So if you were to uh, uh, return the value from Redis Conf, it might not show 2019 because replication in, in Redis is asynchronous. And so it's one of the, the caveats to understand is that you, uh, if your application can tolerate eventual consistency, which many can, uh, then reading from replicas is preferred. However, if you need session level consistency, then uh, being able to read from uh, your primary nodes is, uh, is critical. So the biggest impact on latency, as we discussed before, is network. Uh, and so anything that can minimize the network round trip time can significantly impact your latency and also throughput. Uh, so Elasticash allows you to provision replicas across multiple availability zones, uh, but crossing those availability zone boundaries is, carries a performance penalty. So if latency is, is critical to your application, 
uh, then reading from replicas also within the same a availability zone as your application node is critical. Uh, some clients, like Lettuce here, will allow you to, to do this fairly easily. So by setting the read from uh, instead to the nearest uh, routing rule, it will measure the latency between your uh, client and each of the nodes within the cluster and will direct to the one that uh, is uh, most close from a, from a ping perspective. Uh, and so this will allow you to read uh, locally within an availability zone, uh, but still be able to write to the, the single primary within Redis. Uh, other applications or other clients may not support this exact functionality, and so you may have to uh, configure things uh, differently in each availability zone. And so for Elasticash, we have availability zone specific uh, endpoints for each node, and so con uh, configuring those within your uh, client will allow you to read from uh, a specific availability zone. Uh, so for client configuration, there's a number of other uh, benefits for using persistent connections and connection pooling. So rather than establishing a new TCP connection for each request, which has overhead not just in the TCP handshake, but also within Redis to initialize and establish the, the client object, uh, keeping a connection pool around that's shared within your application allows you to reuse those connections uh, across multiple uh, calls. Uh, so the, in this example, uh, we're using Redis Pi to create a connection pool uh, on line one, and then line nine here will we'll be uh, reusing that same connection pool. So connection pool objects are thread safe, so you can share them across multiple given uh, application threads, uh, and they'll all uh, use those, uh, the same connections rather than creating a new one each time if you were just to initialize a new Redis object. Uh, so when connecting to uh, an application or to a Redis node, it's also important to understand how the client handles failures, uh, because in AWS we uh, we think things uh, nodes can fail at any time, all the time, uh, when when you're operating at the scale that we are, and so we will uh, detect and perform failover in this situation. But the client, uh, if it's not configured properly, uh, may not see that uh, reconnection as quickly as intended. So in this case, the default socket timeout uh, for Redis Pi is infinite, meaning that if the socket's closed uncleanly, it'll just hang and, and could require your, or could cause your application to see a significant outage. So we recommend setting uh, client-side timeouts on your uh, clients here. In this case, it's one, a one-second timeout where the, uh, the, the client will throw back an error if a response is not received in time which means no matter how the node that you're uh, talking to has failed, uh, your client would not uh, be wedged. Uh, pipelining uh, and batching is another uh, way to uh, increase your overall throughput. Uh, because the uh, calls within a, a batch are uh, aggregated together and sent to the server uh, at the same time, it minimizes the uh, overhead per command uh, in terms of the Redis processing, and so can improve the overall throughput significantly. Some clients allow you to do this transparently, where they'll take commands from multiple uh, clients and pipe them over the same connection. Uh, and, even, and some of them allow you to do async APIs, where you'll just fire a, con uh, a request off, and then at some point later receive the result. But many of them, including Redis Pi, use this concept called a pipeline, where it effectively requires the application to batch multiple commands together and then execute them uh, simultaneously. Uh, and so in this case, we are creating a pipeline on line two, uh, adding two, uh, two different commands, inker and zinker by. And when we, uh, when we call those functions, they're not immediately executed. Uh, the uh, call on line five to execute the pipeline is what batches those two commands together uh, to the server and will execute them simultaneously. Uh, this is, uh, the Redis Pi uses uh, pipelining in a transactional sense too. So it'll make sure that either both of these commands happen or no, neither of them happen, but that's not strictly required to achieve the same performance benefits of using pipelining. You're able to just send requests uh, without waiting for the response and uh, realize the same benefits. 
so even with the uh, most optimal client usage, it's still important to understand how your application is using Redis, including the data structures and commands. So one important rule of Redis in general is to understand the computational complexity of the commands that you're calling and avoid those that are extremely expensive uh, because, because all of the command processing is still handled on a single thread. If you call one command that blocks for one second, then all of the commands that are, are waiting behind that will uh, see latencies of one second or greater. Uh, commands like keys will block the entire server while you're iterating through the entire key space, which if you have many keys in your Redis, if you're running a multi-gigabyte node, then it can take quite a while. Uh, and so we recommend using the uh, paginated scan uh, command in order to perform that inter iteration. Uh, similarly, deleting large items will uh, block the server while it recursively frees all of the memory. If you're thinking about a collection with thousands or millions of items, then uh, you'll have to have uh, millions of calls to free at that point. Uh, and uh, in more recent uh, versions as of 4.0, uh, Redis has introduced a asynchronous deletion API, as well as a number of configuration parameters that tune this, uh, called unlink. And uh, that allows you to basically queue the freeing to happen in a background thread, so it doesn't block your requests uh, in the foreground thread. Uh, so memory is reclaimed asynchronously, but uh, the item is logically deleted immediately and will not block going, uh, going further. Uh, large collections are generally a source of uh, problems in Redis because most of these O of N operations only become a problem practically when your collections get very large. So if possible, limiting the size of collections is a safer route if you can split them up across multiple items uh, or just trim your collections if, uh, if old items are no longer necessary. Uh, and slow log is a is functionality built into Redis that will actually uh, go ahead and, and log commands that are coming in that have uh, taken a, a specified threshold of latency and can help debug and diagnose these issues where there may be blocking occurring and you see issues in your, in your application. Uh, making Redis do less work when uh, it's able to is always a win. So for things like fire and forget commands, where you really just want to pump data in as quickly as possible and don't care about the responses, turning off replies will help to, to uh, minimize the in, in second half of the duplex I.O. So then responses will just be dropped on the ground uh, before being uh, streamed back to, to clients. Uh, and so that'll minimize the overall uh, work that has to occur within Redis. Uh, and as a general best practice, it's uh, beneficial to keep your Redis version up to date uh, because there's a number of non-trivial performance and stability fixes that go into each successive version. We've heard from a number of our customers where they've encountered problems that are solved in uh, later versions and so making sure that you are on the, the latest uh, stable is, is always a best practice. Very quickly here I wanted to talk through um, scalability and, and some of the benefits uh, of Redis cluster specifically. So uh, running global apps 24-7, you want to be able to really provide uh, a, a great experience uh, at any scale. And scaling up is limited by the, uh, the physical capabilities of a particular machine. So uh, Redis allows you to be able to scale out uh, across cheaper hardware with, with higher redundancy. Uh, and it's a great approach to storing large amounts of data and quickly scaling out or in. So it uses data sharding, where each shard contains a portion of your overall data, and the number of shards can be increased or reduced, and the data movement occurs uh, to uh, rebalance your data access patterns. This is handled seamlessly from your application, uh, and it, your application will talk directly to the node that owns a, a portion of data without having to go through any sort of intermediary proxy, which can add latency. It also limits the blast radius of a failure of any particular node because rather than your entire key space uh, being out for uh, failover, uh, only a small portion of that key space uh, will, will be impacted on any, any type of failure. Uh, it also has other benefits like uh, faster dis uh, discoverability as well as faster failover. Uh, so cluster mode itself is great, but we heard from customers that the process for scaling out uh, was error prone and difficult to manage. Uh, moving data between shards, and it could come with unexpected applic uh, application outages. 
So we took a look at the problem and identified a better way to perform resharding in an online fashion. So unlike an open source where slots can get split between two primary nodes and impact your workload, slot migration in Elasticache is atomic. Uh, so the data will only be accessible in one shard or the other. So when you perform a scale out operation in Elasticache, we'll distribute the cluster slots across all the nodes uniformly, uh, minimizing the amount of data that has to, to uh, transfer between nodes. Uh, and, and this gives you no application interruption while you're continuing to read and write to the entire cluster. Similarly, if your data size shrinks over time and you no longer need that extra capacity, you can scale in your cluster and in a completely online fashion. Uh, customers have been happy with these improvements to, in, uh, for, for the online ability for resharding, and we're looking to contribute them back uh, to open source so that the entire community can benefit. So cluster mode is our recommended configuration for all of our customers, even if they don't need huge scale up front because it provides you the opportunity to scale in the future. You can just start out with a single node, cluster mode enabled, and then grow in terms of replicas or in terms of shards in the future. Uh, it provides faster failover and can support up to 250 uh, shards, which would be 170 terabytes of data overall. So it gives you a lot of room for growth. Uh, and as a result of all of these benefits, we've seen good growth in uh, the, this uh, cluster mode configuration since we launched it a few years ago. And now it makes up a significant portion of our fleet with some of our uh, most demanding customers relying on it in order to scale. And with that, I wanted to thank you all for attending today. <laughs>